All right, folks, uh, appreciate everyone being here today. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this off just because it's a little bit easier to get off to the side of the podium here. Uh, thank y'all so much. I'm very excited to be with you here today to talk a little bit about economics and technology. So uh, I know it's been a long day for you. Uh, I know you've still got a long day left to come. So we're gonna try to make this as interesting as we can. Um, the core of this is we want to think about all the ways in which we can use economics uh, to uh, study the question of technology, and in particular, what it is we want to get out of new technological innovations, right? So we're noting on the very front end, people don't innovate just because, right? I mean, there, there's a subset of creators that will definitely create things because, but the majority of innovation is done for a reason. People want to provide something of value into the world. And so we can use some of the tools of economics to think about innovation and technology and really start to understand what some of the downstream effects are going to be. So as we do that, I'd like to start with a little deviation from technology and innovation itself and start with what economics is. Right, just at the very core of what are we doing when we're trying to pursue the field of economics and study in economic models. So remember, at the very core of economics, Economics is the study of the way people behave when we're faced with scarcity. Now, scarcity means that we don't have everything we want. It is the limited nature of resources, right? The idea that there is some limit to what is accessible to us. So if we're trying to think about the way people behave when there is limits on our resources, then surely we have to acknowledge that every single person in the world is limited by the resources all the time. Right? And some of our resources, this is obvious. We all know we have limited money. We all know we have limited steel. We all know we have limited land. We know we have limited physical resources. But it's worth noting we also have limited uh, intangible resources. Resources like time. Time is a resource. How you use your time is an economics decision. Economics, the standard thing is we think of bankers and we think of interest rates and we think of profits. And yes, all of that matters. That is a part of the field of economics we care about, but that is not sufficient. That's not the whole story, right? The whole story of economics goes to the whole story of how people behave when they have limited resources, which includes much broader topics than just profit setting behavior. So if we're trying to understand how people behave then economics becomes just as much an endeavor of philosophy or psychology as it does a hard business discipline, right? And that's where I want to start us off, is in the psychology and the philosophy of economics and of what people want to achieve. So let's think about what every person wants in their life. Um, certainly there's a wide ranging list and for different people, there are different components on that list. Some people might have better health care. Some people might have better education. Some people might have closer bonds with families and friends. There's a very long list of things that could be on this. But at the core of all of those, there's a desire for just a general level of happiness, right? That's not the single emotion we only want to feel. We want a full range of emotions, obviously, but happiness is one we pretty commonly strive for. So what economists have done is we've gone through our list of macroeconomic variables. Remember, macroeconomic means big picture. When we look at all of our macroeconomic variables and we try to figure out what is gonna be the best predictor of happiness at a macroeconomic level, the variable that we find most significant is what's called gross domestic product. Gross domestic product is the total production of goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. So I want to be very careful with what I'm saying here uh, and what I'm not saying here. I am not saying that a country's singular objective should be produce, 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 right? That is not the message, right? We can see that's very obviously not the message because we don't spend every minute of our day produce, produce, producing. You would not be a very happy person if you work 16 hours a week, went to bed for eight, woke up and did it all over again. There's other things in my life other than production that very clearly matter. Um, but when we're looking at this macro level of happiness by country, nothing predicts it better at that macro level than GDP per person, the total production of the country per worker, per citizen that they have within it. So what I've got up here for y'all is a little graph to demonstrate this idea. Along the bottom of the graph, we have GDP per capita. So GDP per capita means the total gross domestic product per citizen within the country. So as we move to the right further and further on the graph, that means GDP per capita is going up. That means the country is wealthier and wealthier. 
Uh, as we look on the y-axis, the vertical axis here, the vertical axis is self-reported life satisfaction. So this is a really cool data set that was collected by an organization called Our World in Data. What Our World in Data does is they go around the country, I'm sorry, they go around the world, uh, and they do surveys of every population around the world that they can find. Uh, they do surveys of a lot of different things, but this one in particular is about happiness. It is about what level of life satisfaction would you give yourself? So as we move higher and higher up the scale, that is a higher level of average life satisfaction within this country. Um, so what I want us to do is to give y'all just 30, 45 seconds with this to look over it and just think about what you're seeing. Because uh, I don't know if we're supposed to make this interactive or not, but I'm going to try to. And I'm going to ask for y'all's feedback in a little bit of what this graph is showing us whenever we look up here. So if y'all can take an extra 15 to 30 seconds, look over this graph and try to come up with what's your big conclusions, what looks interesting on this graph when you are overviewing it. All right, I love that we're getting some discussion. So let's go and bring it back up here before uh, we start getting uh, too loud in the background murmur for the cameras and they get mad at me. Um, so let's take it back now and I wanna hear from some of y'all. What were some of the things that just look interesting on this graph to you? Yeah. So a lot of Asian countries kind of in the top right section of that, right? Uh, or I guess the middle right section to the top right. So we see a lot of clustering of regions for sure. Uh, seeing back here, what else we got? So less wealthy countries, those with the lower, income, or lower GDP per capita, do consistently demonstrate a lower aggregate level of happiness. I wanna really emphasize that aggregate because again, I wanna make very clear, this is a macro variable, not a micro, right? This does not mean every individual within all these different countries perfectly match in all these different categories, but when we average them out, we very clearly see a trend, right? The trend we see is that as countries are able to produce more and more and more per person, the life satisfaction self-reported by those populations tends to go up. Not universal, but it does tend to go up. Let's try to go all the way in the back row, see if you can shout it for me. Uh, the U.S. has a lot higher life satisfaction than I <laughs> It's easy to think everyone in the U.S. is really mad right now, right? Uh, and a lot of people in the U.S. might be pretty mad right now, but compared to international countries, life satisfaction in the U.S. is a pretty high number, right? We are on the very high end of this overall scale. Yeah, let's go right here. That's the trend, right? We do want to be careful though. This is not total money. This is production. Now, certainly there's a strong relationship between money and production, but it is not uh, an exact link. So we do want to be careful to differentiate those. But yes, that is the relationship. As countries are able to produce more and more, that brings a little bit more ability to do what? Well, you produce more, you've got that more higher income, you can afford that healthcare now. You can afford that education. You can afford those things that help make the that people actually want to facilitate that extra happiness. All right, I love seeing all the hands. Let's do one more and then I have to pull it back up together. Let's go right here in the middle. Um, I don't quite get the scale on the yeah, so it's not, a, it's not a uniform scale. So basically they did this in order to fit it in on the graph because there's a lot more countries at the low income range than at the high income range. Uh, if you extrapolated this out to make it a consistent scale, instead of being a straight line, it'd probably be something like this where it still does go up as GDP per capita gets higher and higher, but it does go up at a diminishing rate, which is that at some point you get that level where the returns start to level off just a little bit. We still see the overall dynamic. We still see an aggregation of higher self-reported happiness as GDP per capita goes up, but that's a really good catch. It's not a uniform change. It's got some non-linearity within there. So y'all picked up on some really great things. And in particular, y'all picked up on what we wanted to start with. If our goal in economics is to make some philosophical, psychological evaluation of what we can do with our resources to make people happiest, and we start looking out for macroeconomic variables that relate to happiness closely, GDP per capita is an important one for us. There's a good relationship here. Doesn't mean it's causal. 
Causation and correlation is not the same thing, but there's some underlying link that is important for us to study and for us to understand. Now, where that's going to take us is to the question of productivity. Why do some countries produce more than other countries do? The number one driver we have to answer that question is the idea of productivity. Productivity is the idea of the amount of output produced per labor unit, right? So it could be output per worker. It could be output per worker hour. It could be output per day, whatever it is. It's some output per labor of unit used. And the reason we look at that GDP per capita so closely, or when we look at that GDP per capita so closely, what we see is that the GDP per capita is driven by productivity more than anything else. Being productive is what allows countries to produce more. Straightforward enough idea. So where does the idea of technology come into this discussion? Well, let's start with a little story. Let's think about a football field or a piece of land the size of a football field. Let's assume that this piece of land the size of a football field is full of wheat. It is wheat ready to harvest. You are ready to extract that wheat to feed the people with it. Let's think originally about one individual who owns this land and who is harvesting this wheat using a scythe. Uh, the scythe is, if you've ever seen like a picture of the Grim Reaper uh, idea, it's that little pole that's got the bended blade on the end. Those scythes have historically been used to harvest crops. Farmers will swing them back and forth and it chops down those crops so that you can harvest them. So let's think about how long it would take one farmer to harvest that football field worth of wheat using one handheld knife, functionally, that they go around and chop this whole wheat down. Y'all think about it in your head for five seconds, and then we'll bring it up. Might be thinking a couple hours, might be thinking a day. Some of y'all might be thinking a couple weeks. It'd be hard for me, not necessarily in the best shape in the world. It'd be hard to do a football field worth of wheat with one scythe. That's an ordeal, right? That, that's, that's a big undertaking. Uh, I'm going to say a minimum of a day, probably four to five. It's going to take some time to do. Now, let's think about that exact same farmer, that exact same field with the exact same goal of harvesting the wheat, except this time the farmer has a tractor. How quickly can that farmer get that football field done with the tractor? 30 minutes. Yeah, it is immediate. It is there. What does that mean for the other four and 0.9 days of the stretch that you were spending using your scythe cutting down that wheat. You can relax, right? You can spend time with your family. You can find other ways to be productive and to contribute. You can play games. You can go on vacation, whatever it is. We care about innovation, not just because it's cool to invent new things, but because as we innovate new technologies, we're able to produce more. And as we produce more, we're able to uh, achieve all of those life satisfaction things we're looking for, like that education and that healthcare and that steady food supply, right? And as we're able to produce all that stuff using less effort, using less time input, that frees up all of our other time to pursue elements of happiness, develop relationships, take care of our families, develop social bonds. Those are things that are difficult to do if you're working in a manufacturing plant 16 hours a day. Right? New innovation and new technology frees us from some of those constraints. It lets us achieve the same level of production using significantly less labor so that we can use our labor to do the other things we care about and ultimately find that level of happiness. Right? If that's the core goal of economics, then what technology and innovation does is it gives us a straight path through from innovation to productivity to production to happiness. Right? And that's why we care so much about this. Right? Because it is such a good predictor of what the macro level of happiness for a country is going to look like. So with all of that in mind, let's go a little bit into your packet and start thinking about some specific innovations. Uh, in particular, innovations of technology that were useful in this period that's called the Great Enrichment. Right? Y'all had this little peer, uh, pack, portion of your packet that talked about the Great Enrichment starting 200, 250 years ago, somewhere around there. So quick lesson on the collective sum of the economic history of humanity. Prior to maybe 1750, um, economies pretty much stagnant. There's some fluctuations. They have high periods and low periods, some expansions and a war wipes them out. But if we look at long time periods and we look at GDP per capita growth of all these nations over thousands of years, we're talking about thousands of years where GDP per capita growth may be averaged 0.1% per year, very little marginal uh, ticking up changes 
along the edges to the great enrichment where we're seeing the size of our economy double every couple of decades, right? This is a rapid difference from the entire collective sum of human history. We're living in some pretty truly extraordinary times being on the back end of this great enrichment period, or maybe still at the beginning of it. Who knows this, how long this goes on, but um, being in this great enrichment period. So your book's got some different examples of different innovations and what they've contributed to uh, over those last 250 years. I wanna add a couple more within these same categories. So when we think about mechanization, they offered up the example of the early world equivalent of the tractor I just described, right? One drawn by a horse instead of by a machine that we're thinking of now, but it was still functionally a tractor. It helps uh, harvest crops significantly more quickly. It helped transform the economies of virtually every Western country in the world from being about 50 to 70% farmers to now in the US, we're about one to 2% farmers. Right? We freed up a lot of other time that we don't have to spend on just making food through the mechanization of things like uh, tractors and in the agriculture sector, things like fertilizers. So let's just think outside of those examples a little bit. Think about mechanization. Um, how many people in this room want to buy a Tesla someday? A couple of hands. Yeah, it's a pretty common car. Uh, some folks are pretty excited about it. One of the things Tesla is most known for relative to all their other competitors in the vehicle space is they automate their process significantly more than even the Fords and the Toyotas and others. Uh, They use less manual labor and more machines. That's got downstream concerns. We definitely have inequality concerns we wanna be aware of. We're not going to ignore those by any stretch. But for today, we wanna talk about the technology itself. And the technology itself, whenever we're able to produce the same product using less human labor, that means humans get to do other things with their time. Right, that frees us up to pursue other endeavors that we care about. Uh, and it's why things like automation are such a big deal within so many sectors right now. Uh, we think about uh, materials. Um, I see a bunch of y'all writing on pens, a bunch of y'all typing on laptops. Um, pretty much every pen and laptop and phone being used in this room right now uh, used oil and gas to produce it. And we be careful with that. When we say oil and gas, we don't just mean like the raw production that moved the machinery. But I mean, we took oil and gas and we transformed it into something completely different. We transform it into plastic, right? That transformation of materials, that innovative way to take some core molecular structure and alter it into something else allows us to now innovate new products that we never had access to prior, right? So that innovation unlocks all sorts of things like every single person who's wearing even just a sweatshirt that's got a little zipper on it, that's coming from some transformation of raw materials put into a different form, right? So all this innovation unlocks all these things we care about. Talked about agriculture, energy. Energy is at the forefront of every po- public policy debate today, right? The innovations going on in the renewable sector are truly incredible. Uh, they're not done. They've got a ways to go. By no means are they perfect techs, but this is an ongoing innovation and technological development that could drastically change the day-to-day life of uh, the world around us. Uh, not could, it already is, right? It already is. So uh, we think about the energy sector doing the same thing, transportation doing the same thing, right? What does the, in, uh, the invention of airplanes do for global commerce? All right? You want to uh, take a shot at it? It makes the transport of goods faster. It also allows for more people to make planes parts, which improves GDP. So produces a lot of extra jobs for sure, but really it's that speed of, pro- uh, speed of production, right? So it is the idea we produce something here in the U.S. We want to ship it over to Germany. Uh, 200 years ago, what does that mean? That means you put it on a boat and you hope that boat doesn't drive into a storm, right? If it does, maybe you lose all your stuff. So it's not just faster, but it's also safer, right? There's much less wasted labor. Uh, The very idea that we have transportation, we think about it for uh, vacations and for going all around the world. Clearly that matters for our happiness, that's important. But for the economy, it's a productivity measure, right? Greatly makes us significantly more productive so that we can free up that time to do other things. Uh, Same thing with communication, right? This isn't a new example. Everyone during COVID knows what it's like to switch over to Zoom, right? Y'all had to innovate on the fly, get over into Zoom, teach all your, uh, learn all your classes that way. Well, from a business perspective, what that means is uh, some little firm in the corner of San Antonio, which is making uh, raw concrete, can get on the phone and develop a partnership with a company in South Korea, and they can talk face-to-face to hammer out the specifics of their deal. That negotiation never happens even 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that's tough to do, right? This new innovation unlocks all these new markets, all these new connections, all this new production, which helps facilitate that happiness. 
Uh, and the one that gets probably the least credit, but is maybe the most important, the germ theory of disease. Anyone want to take a shot at what the single most life-saving innovation in human history has been? And I'll put a character uh, qualifier on this. This is my opinion. It's not universal truth. It's tough to estimate. But I'm going to give you all the one that I think is best. Let me get a couple of y'all's guesses first. Soap. Sorry? Soap. Soap. Soap could definitely be a part of it. Not exactly what I'm looking for. Penicillin. Penicillin, definitely a useful one. Not exactly what I'm looking for. Antibiotics, Antibiotics definitely a useful one. Not exactly what I'm looking for. Vaccine, definitely an important one, not exactly what I'm looking for. Let's go all the way in the back. Sewage systems, toilets, toilets. Um, there is perhaps no single invention in human history which has saved more lives than the toilet. Um, it is, it is a little uncomfortable to think about, but the simple reality is that for the collective sum of human history, figuring out what to do with your waste was a major problem. It was a major problem to the point that it spread large scale disease throughout populations all across the globe. All sorts of different civilizations have their own unique experiences on how they dealt with disease and what sort of fallout it caused. The simple act of getting that waste away from the population as quickly as possible is a massive innovation in extending human lifespan. Uh, and so with all of that said, I do want to qualify. This is the best argument I've seen. Different people disagree on what the single most important is. Y'all gave me a lot of really great examples, but I think the one that really deserves credit is the toilet. Because we don't think of that as an innovation today. That's just taken for granted, right? That's in every house, every building, every place we go. But at one point, that was a game changer, right? That extended the lifetimes of entire populations and let them rise above, uh, above others. Um, the toilet, the simple idea that we have a better understanding of the physical world around us and how to deal with that world has increased lifespans from averages of 40 to 50 years per person to today in the US, in the Europe and different uh, Western countries, we're up getting close to 80 years per uh, person on average, almost doubling the average lifespan of an average person. What do you do if your life becomes twice as long? How much extra happiness does that unlock? How much extra ability to uh, connect with family and friends does that offer you? Right? We care about these innovations because that's the sort of downstream uh, outcome that it allows us to pursue. Um, so with all of that said, the values of innovation should be relatively self-evident. Uh, right? When we think about all the things that influence the overall economy and the different innovations we come up with, it's not hard to see how vaccines and uh, germ treatment and airplanes and Zoom meetings can help make the economy more effective. But as economists, the very first thing we teach every single econ class is that everything has a trade-off. And everything is not an overstatement. Everything is an accurate statement. When we think about economics, economics at its core, we said is how people respond to scarcity, to limited resources. The very fact that those resources are limited mean that as soon as you use them in one place, you can't use them anywhere else. There is always that trade-off, right? There is always some cost-benefit proposition. Uh, and I think it's very easy to conclude that the cost-benefit trade-off for innovation skews heavily to the benefit side, so much so that we obviously want to keep pursuing more and more innovation. But as economists, we want to be honest about that trade-off as well. We want to understand the full cost-benefit trade-off we're facing. So this is where Joseph Schumpeter came into play. Uh, this economist uh, from, a, I think, 100, 150 years ago, somewhere around there, uh, came up with the term creative destruction. Uh, notice, he does not say creative replacement, doesn't say re creative nudging, creative supplementation, creative augmentation, creative alteration. It's creative destruction. It's a pain. It hurts. There is a pain that sometimes is caused by innovation. What's the pain caused by innovation? Well, let's ask the coal mining towns in West Virginia who have been hollowed out because natural gas is a fundamentally superior product. All right, let's think about the families who have um, systematic unemployment, declining law, uh, life expectancies, addictions to opioids, in large part because all of their economic opportunities just started drying up as the economy innovated. That's real pain. And if there is one critique that I want to offer for my own field, for economists, it's that we're too ready to ignore that pain. Right? We're too ready to focus on the benefit side without giving a full consideration to the cost side without that honest evaluation of what the full trade-off is. Now, I want to make sure I'm very clear here. I'm not saying stop innovating. 
That is in no way, shape, or form the argument. Uh, I think natural gas is one of the most significant innovations in the last uh, 50 or so years in the world, uh, specifically because compared to coal, it is cheaper, it is cleaner, uh, it pr uh, pr produces significantly less pollution, uh, it's much easier to transport, and it's much more efficient. It in almost every way makes the user better off. But some of the producers are getting left behind. And this is one of the things that makes economics such an interesting topic. The question is, what do we do about that? No one, we don't have an answer for it. There is no solution to how do we weigh the trade-off between the costs and the benefits created. That's why economics is a philosophy as much as it is a business, right? We don't want to get stuck in the numbers and say, well, yeah, a bunch of people were hurt, but average life expectancy when we innovate going up by two years, so we can just ignore all that, count, all that pain. No, we want to be honest about it, right? We want to figure out the way to minimize the cost of our innovation. We want to find a way to minimize the technological unemployment, right? Those coal miners who for decades have been relying on that same job to pay for the food, for the home, for the clothing of their families are now having a tough time providing the bare necessities to the people they love. That matters. That hurts. So what makes economics such a fascinating subject is we get to ask that question of how do we deal with that trade-off, right? How do we deal with the cost-benefit trade-off that comes with any sort of change? So what I would like y'all to do to give myself a couple minute break from uh, speaking constantly, let's think about a couple of industries in which we have either seen job loss due to technological innovation or in which you think there might be future job loss due to technological innovation. Where might we be seeing some of these changes in the near horizon? Yep. Uh, the typewriter, industry. typewriter, for sure, right? How many typists went out of uh, work whenever the advent of the computer came around and everyone had their own personal uh, computer nearby? Massive, massive levels. Let's come over here. Uh, movie theaters, as the son of a movie theater owner, this is one I'm particularly worried about. Right? Movie theaters are very much in danger right now as there's more and more stay at home options. That's a great one. Let's go second row over here with the glasses. Yep. Uh, potentially artists. That could be an interesting one. So art's going to be a tough one because there's such an innate human component of it. At the same time, we're seeing what some of these AI things can do in their very early stages. And it's reasonable to ask how far can they go with that? So that might be one in the future that's uh, tough to predict for me personally but it would not entirely shock me to see some technological unemployment there for sure. Let's come here. Uh, arcades. Uh, arcades for sure, but be careful. We wanna focus on the unemployment in particular. So I would be careful with arcades. Arcades is one of those where I think it's a relatively tr easy transition over to other jobs. You probably lost a lot of the cashiers who were working at arcades that lost their jobs, but they could probably pretty easily move into something like a cashier for a fast food service, right? So definitely a good thought. We're seeing a change for sure, but I'm not sure we've got as much of the unemployment there. Next one, so all the way in the back with a hat. Retail workers, for sure. How many retail workers lost their job because of Amazon? Whoo, that's a big number. Uh, it's not done growing, right? That is a big component for sure. How about right here in the glasses? Uh, so banks, we're gonna be a little bit careful on that one in particular. Uh, banks will be one that actually on our next slide is gonna be an interesting thing, probably coming up in the near future. Certainly tellers have seen a pretty substantial change in their responsibilities. Uh, and some jobs might come down soon. So we're running a long time. Let's just do one more right here as well. Oh, AI is going to change so much, right? Uh, how are we going to amend to large numbers of everyday rank and file business employees, kind of those middle managers, having the entirety of their job replaced by automation? Because that might happen. That, that's a possibility. So uh, some really good examples. I'd love to keep going around for all of y'all's, but we got to keep moving on some of this. So let's close with that exact question. Disruptive potential of AI. So what we have here is a graph of some of the major industries. Uh, it's pretty evident that y'all can't see the industries well, so I apologize. Let me just tell you the top two, and I'll tell you the bottom two as well. Uh, the top two are going to be banking, and gosh, I can't even see it here. That's how small it got. Uh, are going to be... Uh, banking and insurance, and the bottom two are gonna be chemicals and natural resources. So everything in the middle, basically just let's say what the different colors are. When you look to the far right of the graph, the kind of the light purple color, light purple is those percentage of the jobs within those industries, which are not likely to be impacted by large language models. So this is specifically only a graph of the threat of large language models, not even all AI. 
just AI of the sort, that's chat GPT. So when we look at, for example, natural resources out all at the bottom, 64% of jobs, that big light purple area uh, on the natural resources section, comes from the percentage of those natural resources jobs which cannot be influenced by a large language model in any way. The dark purple all the way on the left is gonna be the percentage of jobs that can be replaced by a large language model. The green one in the middle is gonna be the percentage of jobs that can be enhanced using large language models. So it is still a job, but it actually makes that job more productive to integrate AI into it. And the pink sliver in the middle is going to be that portion of jobs that has some potential for either augmentation or replacement, but are pretty low level. It's not likely to be a component in there. So I bring this up just to say, our economy is about to change. Uh, it is. We, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. This is one projection, right? This isn't a universal thing. There's still clearly a lot of jobs within banking. And if you can be one of those people who keep the banking jobs, there's probably pretty high returns to be available from it. But there's going to be some disruption. There's going to likely be some technological unemployment. Does that mean we don't pursue AI? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not comfortable hearing a professor say, I don't know. But the reality is economics deals with those trade-offs. And each individual needs to evaluate that trade-off themselves. What's the cost-benefit trade-off? Is it worth it? What we can say is the benefit's going to be enormous, right? And again, we're talking about the economy side, none of the self-awareness side, none of the potential cataclysm side. Those are still things to incorporate in your trade-off. But from the pure economy side alone, even just the economy, there's a trade-off to consider. There will be creation of positions. There will be destruction of decisions. In aggregate, it's likely going to help all our lives become better. We'll likely have, be able to work less, have more leisure, more time at home. And as long as we can still get our needs met while doing that, it's a good thing. If we can't get our needs met while doing that, uh-oh, that's a problem, right? So that's a key question that our generation, your generation is going to have to face. Yeah, I think I saw a question coming right here. I know you're trying to get it in. What did you say was the second one after that? Second one is insurance. Uh, yeah, so a lot of those, basically those uh, industries which are um, very heavy on things like paperwork and monotonous repetitive tasks, those are ones that AI is going to be very well suited to do. Whereas things like natural resources at the bottom, going out around the world and finding new places where there might be silicon or nickel or, uh, or lithium deposits, whatever it might be, that's going to be a lot harder for AI to potentially do. All right, so uh, this is just to give us some real world application of this cost benefit trade-off. Um, again, none of this is saying one way or the other how you should feel about AI. What this is saying is that if you wanna be an economist, we can't put blinders on. We have to think about both sides of this cost benefit trade-off proposition because it is always, always there. The nature of scarcity, the fact that resources can only go to one place at a time means that every time we devote some resources to create a winner, we're potentially creating a loser somewhere else. And that's what makes economics such a fascinating discipline to study. It's not just business, it is philosophy, it is psychology, it is the study of the way humans behave. And that's what we're trying to understand is how we interact with technology and why it makes our lives in aggregate tends to be a better overall thing. Uh, all right, that does leave us with one final question of, how do we get as much innovation as possible? Let's say we've done our cost benefit trade off. We've evaluated that the billions of lives saved by vaccines and by toilets and by airplanes and by fertilizers and all these different things outweigh the creative destruction that comes to coal mining towns and different sectors throughout the economy. Let's say we conclude that the overall economy works best when we are able to free up people from labor as much as we can, free up our time to do other things. What can we do to try and get as much innovation as possible so that we can increase that overall productivity? So uh, this is one where it'd be great if we had a little whiteboard, I can walk through it, but we'll walk through it intuitively. Let's think about our basic model of supply and demand. Right? Everyone remember your basic supply and demand model from the packet? We have a downward sloping demand curve indicating that when the price of something is higher, the quantity demands at its lowest. When the price goes down, quantity demand it goes up. Everyone remembers the upward sloping supply curve. When the price is at the lowest, people are least willing to supply it. As the price goes up, people supply more, right? We remember that little X. Well, what's interesting about innovation is that that market dynamic is not sufficient to get the level of innovation we want. 
And the way we know that is because innovation confers what's called a positive externality. So a positive externality. Remember, externalities are any instance in which you have an uncompensated cost or benefit. Someone makes an action within a market and it impacts someone outside of the market. That's an externality. A market's nothing more than a tool. I know markets get very bad um, uh, publicity these days and for a lot of reasons. We haven't always used this tool well, but at its core, it's a tool, just like a hammer is. A hammer can be used to build a house or it could be used to smash someone's head. How you use the tool depend, uh, determines the efficacy of it. Markets work the same way. When we use markets responsibly, they're one of the single greatest tools for facilitating the growth of society and the growth of well-being that we've ever come up with. Used the wrong way, we've seen what sort of devastation they can cause. So when markets are working well though, uh, we like to think that the balance of that supply and the balance of that demand come, in to come together and those two things collectively guide our market to a position that we would consider approximately socially optimal. Right? We get the about right amount of oil we need. We get the about right amount of food we need. We get the about right amount of clothing we need through markets whenever they're working effectively. Well, one of the things that stops markets from working effectively is externalities. It is the uncompensated cost and benefit that accrues outside of the market. Why? Well, because the very nature of the market is that it balances the supply of the producers with the demand of the consumers. But what happens when someone's impacted that's not a supplier or a consumer? They don't have any influence in that market. They don't have any say. Their, compo their input doesn't get incorporated to it. So that means the market fails to account for that comp uh, benefit or that cost. One of those benefits that tends to get excluded from markets is the spillover benefit from technology, right? Clearly, there's a component that fits. So we can think about, think about a market for research and development. We have a downward sloping demand curve where firms are demanding new research and development. The more expensive it is to research and develop new technologies, the less firms are gonna do it. The cheaper it is to innovate and in research and develop new technologies, the more firms are gonna do it. That's our downward sloping demand curve. Who's our suppliers? Our suppliers are you. You're the supplier of innovation. You're the producer, right? You're the one who can go work for a Dow Chemical or a Tesla Auto or any of these other companies that is trying to innovate new research and development new technologies. <coughs> Excuse me. Are you going to go do that? Well, it might depend in part how much they're willing to pay you for it, right? If they're willing to pay you more to go work for them and try to innovate, you're more likely to go there. That's our upward sloping supply curve. So there's some interaction there that can incorporate some level of equilibrium between the demand for innovation and the supply of it. But what's missing is the spillover benefit, All right? Let's say you go work for Dow Chemical. Working for Dow Chemical for a couple of years, you innovate this new technology, which is going to drastically reduce the overall pollution that oil and gas producers make whenever they frack a well, right? We're talking like, let's say you make a 90% reduction in overall pollution that occurs. Clearly, that's gonna benefit Dow. Clearly, that's gonna benefit you, but that's also gonna benefit me. And I had no part of that market. Right? I wasn't a part of your decision whether or not to go work for Dow Chemical. You've created a positive externality, a spillover benefit that goes into the broader society. You've created a value for research and development that exceeds the value to Dow Chemical just themselves. When we have positive and negative externalities in markets, we call that a market failure. It is a market failure not in the sense that the market can't be used at all and has to be immediately shut down, it is a failure in the sense that we are not fully incorporating the cost benefit trade-off, that there is something missing from that calculation. When we have a positive externality, fortunately, we have a really efficient way to address that market failure. And it's what we call a subsidy. A subsidy is basically a government supplement to a particular market, right? The uh, buyers or the producers of a market will get some additional funding put onto their side in order to encourage them to participate in this market more. I think y'all can probably guess where this is going, but does anyone want to take a guess at what the single biggest investor of research and development across the entire world is? It's the US government. It's the US federal government, right? And they do it indirectly in a lot of ways. They do it through companies, but the single organization in the entire world which is put, devoting more resources to the innovation of new technology and development is the US federal government. 
And they're not doing this just because it's a blanket overarching giveaway to corporations. There are blanket overarching giveaways to corporations, be careful, but there is a very real economic reason for government to play a role in the research and development market. And it's because that market left to its own device without that innovation, uh, I'm sorry, without that subsidy, is going to undersupply innovation. We won't get as much innovation as we wanna see within society if we leave those markets to their own device. And that's where the role for government potentially comes into play. This is a classic case of a role for government in markets. Markets, again, don't wanna undersell incredibly powerful tools. We do not wanna get rid of them. We do want to use them responsibly, right? We don't wanna just uh, use it as the negative iteration of the hammer. We wanna use it as the version of the hammer that helps us build the house, not as the version that helps us tear it down. So when we use those markets well, there is a very real role for government to help us do that. Innovation and technology is one of the most uh, substantial roles of the US federal government. It is facilitating that new investment so that we can get that new tech Hopefully then we can figure out what to do next about the creative destruction it creates because again, we don't want to ignore that side of the trade-off. And again, self-critique as economists, we do that too often. We get those blinders on and we see the benefit and we look at the value and say, okay, that's it. We're going full steam ahead, no consideration, nothing else. We don't want to do that, but we also don't want to ignore the role that government has to play in facilitating an efficient market here either. All right, so that took us through a few different things. I've got uh, four minutes left on my time and I went through a lot of different topics. So would anyone like to do a short little Q&A, anything that came to mind either from the presentation or the run through y'all's packet that we wanna use our last four minutes on? Thoughts, ideas, anything you've seen on social media, Us. Uh, yeah, so markets are weird. They're a tool, yes, but they're a tool that's basically an aggregation of people. So when you talk about a market, a market is nothing more than a whole bunch of people interacting with each other. When we're talking about using markets effectively, what I'm specifically meaning is putting incentive structures in place that keep that market guided away from market failure and towards our equilibrium. Right, so there are many, many cases in which markets fail left to our own devices. There are some tools we can implement to minimize that. It is not universal. There, again, some of the trade-offs, if we're gonna try and implement some change to influence a market one direction, it's going to create a trade-off somewhere else. So I'm not saying one size fit all, more intervention, good versus bad, anything like that. Uh, but what I am saying is that we can set policies and regulations and structures that will keep that market guided around its central principles. Central principles you have to have for a market to work, right? The core idea of the, the chapter four market dynamics that y'all go through, markets must have competition. Without competition, markets are not effective tools, right? Your most hardcore libertarian can still acknowledge that competition is a necessity for markets to operate efficiently. When competition is lacking, that's the sort of place that government can potentially step in and influence it. Same thing with externalities. In order for markets to be efficient, we need to have the full cost benefit impact restricted to the market players themselves. When that doesn't happen, again, there's an opportunity to set some guidelines to keep that market guided towards those dynamics. Yeah, let's come down here. Uh, so you talked about how movie theaters were going out of business because of the rise of home streaming. Do you think by chance it could probably maybe come back? Well, it could, and I'll be careful. It's not universal, right? When I say going away, I don't necessarily mean the entirety of the movie theater industry is done. Um, I'll give an example. One of the things that my parents think that they might have a little bit of room for optimism on is they've got uh, four different movie theaters. They are all five screens or less. So they're all small movie theaters and they've selectively picked only very small uh, population towns. So towns with under 20,000 people in them. Their thought was, okay, movie theater in the city of San Antonio. Uh, we've got so many entertainment options, right? You want to figure out what to do one night and you got unlimited options to do. If you wanna watch a movie, eh, I can do that one at home. I, I've got other ways to be entertained outside. Some of these smaller towns, they don't have those options, right? The movie theater for a lot of these smaller towns is still kind of like that central hub where a lot of people aggregate out of the home, where if you wanna leave the home, you can either go to um, Red Robin for the sixth time this week, or you can go to the movie theater. Those are some of the entertainment options. So it won't be universal by any stretch. It will depend on the marketing strategies and the dynamics and the, mar and the overall population around it. Um, but when you say creative destruction, we don't need it to go away entirely. 
Creative destruction exists even when those jobs fall, even if they're not completely disappearing. Right? And so that's kind of more what I'm referencing with the movie theater. All right, I got time for one more. I think I saw one more hand over here. We'll close it up. So good question. We've only talked about the production side here, right? Nothing about my presentation said anything about profit margins. So that is a multifaceted question. I'll give you a couple of different things that could contribute to it. Number one, uh, private firms move a lot more quickly than government does. So when government's looking out and saying, okay, we're looking for ways to facilitate more innovation 20 years ago, and they're looking at oil and gas companies competing against Saudi Arabia and some of these foreign producers, they're thinking, okay, if we're gonna innovate, we need some subsidy put on here. So we pass a bill, we pass some money, we uh, put it into law that these organizations get these funds. Time moves forward, dynamics change. Government doesn't change very fast, right? There is that staticism sometimes, that, that stagnation, that it takes a lot longer for change in the government sector than the private. So some of it is remnant of spillover still remaining from previous times that we haven't addressed moving into modernity. Um, some of it is that those benefits specifically only go for research and development innovations. So there is profit that the firm is going to have that's going to go over into their shareholders' bank accounts and all those different things. Um, but sometimes what you can do is you can still earmark dollars specifically for R&D that was all, it was always going to go to the shareholders originally, but now because it is cheaper to invest in research and development, maybe they'll switch it over. Um, I will note, I am not a public policy expert by any stretch, so maybe we need to leave that one for a politician who is. Um, but I, yeah, I would just say, I think the slow moving nature is a thing. Government's not perfect either. Uh, I won't go too much into the details because again, I'm not the politician, uh, but the, the singular pursuit of the collective good doesn't necessarily seem to be the singular objective of the government all the time, right? So there are always competing interests that are potentially involved. Uh, beyond that, I'll leave it to a political expert to say about why these specific innovations are involved. What I can say is that, again, when this works well, when government does what it's supposed to be doing, not saying it necessarily is right now, but when it's filling the role it should be filling in society, there is a very real role for them to facilitate the additional investment in research and development. Um, whether or not that happens like we want it to is um, very much up in the air. Uh, but yeah, it's I guess I'm speaking more as the philosopher idealist than the pragmatist right now. And there's a lot to be said about the practical reality of how we do this. Uh, all right, y'all. So we're at the end of my time. Thank y'all so much for letting me spend uh, some of this afternoon with you. Hope y'all enjoyed the presentation. Hope we got a, a few good things out of it. Um, if anyone ever wants to talk econ in the future, all my info is on the UIW website. Be happy to tell you more about our programs. Um, as Dr. Salfin said, I'm the chair of the Department of Economics and Management. So if anyone's interested in pursuing a business degree here at UIW, uh, y'all pull my information online uh, and I'll be happy to give you answer any questions you have and talk with you more. Um, aside from that, thank y'all so much and y'all have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. <laughs>